I'm back to work on the 89 and I'm trying to figure out the power windows on this thing. It's doing something that I've never had happen before. So I've got the switch here and I've got my test light. And normally what happens is you apply, you, basically you turn the switch on to go up and voltage will go through one of these two wires that goes to the motor. Now these are, the, I've put the new motor in here. I haven't hooked it up yet because I can't get it to work. Um, so I'm gonna push up on the switch for the window to go up. Okay, the light comes on, the test light that I've got stuck in there. And you can get these test lights anywhere. This is just kind of a really cheap one from Harbor Freight. So normally you would have power on one side and ground on the other. That's what would make the, the motor go one direction. Okay, I'm gonna change positions here. So I'm gonna go to what should be the downside. Now, you should not see voltage on this when you push for the window to go up. But I've got voltage on it. So I'm not an electrical engineer by any means, but I do know a few things about DC electronics. And that tells me I've got a short somewhere or I've got something that's not grounded because I'm seeing power on both sides when I should only see power on one. It's not completing a circuit. It's just running the voltage through the wires and it's not actually grounding to anything to make this work. It Honestly, this took me a better part of a day to figure out. So if you look over here on the door, I've added a second ground wire. And this wire goes along this harness up here into the dash. And this is where there was a wire grounded for the alarm system, that little hole right there. So I've run a wire up in here. And I'm going to put this self-tapping screw through this wire. And then I'm going to secure that self-tapping screw with a star washer so that it makes a good ground. And I'm going to have to put it in the impact lane here in order to get a good bite on it. So by grounding this wire, in theory, this should make these power windows work now. All right, so I've got that lined up. So we got that grounded. Now, you can hear the motor in there running. You can see I've only got power on one side of the wire. That's all that was. I have chased this all day long. I ran my multimeter through all of these pins here, up through this harness that goes up under the dash, comes out right here, over here under the dash to double check that the wiring in the door is good because sometimes what you'll see is the wires and the jam up here over time in this rubber boot opening and closing the door it wears the wires out they eventually break so i thought well maybe i'm dealing with a broken wire in the jam so after chasing the wires all through the jam it's like okay that's not it i tested the ground using my multimeter here on the continuity test and the continuity test is a really simple audible signal on the multimeter. And most of your multimeters have a little, like a Bluetooth emblem there to let you know that it's on audible so that when you touch the leads together, it should beep. So we'll put the black lead up here, the red lead, we'll touch to it. All right, so we got a beep there. Down here on the seat stud that I fixed is where I've got my test light grounded. So I'm gonna throw my black lead in there. If I can get it to drop in between the stud. All right, we'll stick it in. This is a lot harder to do one-handed. All right, there's that. Put the lead in the next to the stud. Okay, I came over here to the door where this ground is. And now I have continuity. I didn't before. So the only thing that I can think of that would cause this car to lose ground from the door shell to the body is that these hinges are just so corroded now on the inside that it's just not making a good signal. So 
what I did is I just basically took a piece of wire and I ran it up through the harness and up into the car through the jam, uh, going through the rubber boot for all the wires. And then now I've got it grounded in here. So I'll take that back off and then I'm going to put one of these star washers underneath of that eyelet on the wire so that it maintains a good signal to the body of the car because eventually it could start to corrode around it, but this will really help bite into the metal and it keeps it a good signal. So now that I have that figured out, I can go ahead and bolt my motor up and it makes me wonder if the power locks will work now. Okay, so I got one on the passenger side working, but my driver's side is not. So good thing I bought actuators. I'll show you guys how to change out the door actuators on a Fox body while I'm in here. So the door lock actuator is down inside of the frame of the door. And you see the bracket that holds it's the white plastic piece there. And in the middle of that bracket, it's really hard to see, but there's actually a rivet in the middle. That's what that black piece is. This is the actuator itself. It kind of snaps into the, the white plastic bracket. It moves the door lock up and down like this. So that's what controls the lock and unlock mechanism of the door. And like I said, I've had these lock me out of the car before where they got frozen in the lock position, which is up on this particular one. So how you get these out is you have to drill out this rivet right here and knock out the center of the rivet, which is the black, the shiny silver piece in the middle. We'll get a punch and we'll knock that out. And then I'll get a quarter inch drill bit and I'll drill this rivet out until this falls out. So the back part of the rivet will stay on the bracket. This face part of the rivet will come off and then I'll be able to get the new one on from there. All right, so I'm going to take my punch, go to the middle of that rivet. I might need a thicker punch because this one's starting to bend a little bit. And I'm going to lay that drill bit up there. There we go. Punched out the middle. Sometimes you just have to put your first in. And then I'll walk around the other side of the car, get my drill. I just got a really cheap quarter inch drill bit from Harbor Freight. All it has to do is go through this pot metal rivet. And I want to make sure that I've got it somewhat straight on there. All right, so we got the head of the rivet off. Watch out, that could be hot sometimes. And then I'm going to reach in here and get my actuator. Feels like it just completely disintegrated in there. And you have to kind of flip the rod. This rod that comes through has to be flipped off of the actuator. Bring the window up a little bit to give myself some room in here. Basically, like the end of this actuator's got like a, a, um, a little rod on it and the end of the rod has a bend that goes through the bracket and I'll show you in a minute while I'm fighting it so bad unplug this really careful not to break the, the plug. I thought I had 
upholstery tool. We're using that. I just want to bring this clip up just a little bit so that it doesn't break when I bring it off. Now they have special tools and stuff for this, but that would require me to get up and go back over to the toolbox and get something. I just basically need to get it up where it'll slide off of this actuator. There we go. Because I don't want to break that clip right there. Otherwise, it might be hard to get the new one to stay on. All right, so now that we got the old one off, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Here on the end of it, it's got that turned like elbow that has to go through the lock mechanism and then can rotate down. So here's what the old one looks like and it pops right out of the bracket. Make sure that when you do this to get the remnants of the old rivet out, that piece right there, otherwise it'll float around in the door, cause some additional rattling. You know, Fox bodies have enough rattle without adding anything to it. And then your new actuator, the idea that you would want to do here is to mimic the same length of the shaft and the same angle of that arm with what's included in the package. So I think I'm probably gonna go with this one right here. Looks like it's gonna be relatively the same. Now, of course, this is this arm is all the way up right now, so this, this actuator is all the way up. This one is down, the old one is down, and the new one is up. So this length, you can actually adjust it a little bit. It's really not too hard to do. You would basically just kind of cut this off with a cutoff wheel and then drill a hole in it. The new one has this little collar and in this collar is a roll pin. So that's how you attach that arm to the new actuator. So I'll get that out and get it on there and get these two lined up where they're relatively the same length. And then I'll get the new actuator ready to go in the door. I'm gonna go grab my rivet gun and a quarter inch rivet show you guys how to do this. I've got the arm on there and then I went ahead and put the roll pin, started it with a pair of pliers, but I'm gonna use the vise to kinda go ahead and tighten that up the rest of the way. We'll go ahead and tighten the vise and get it relatively close. I'm gonna put a little bit of pressure and then come right back. So now that I have a little bit of pressure on there, I can go ahead and finish squeezing that roll pin up into the that collar like that. And that should be good. I'll go ahead and grab this with one hand, loosen the vise, and there we go. The pin's in there holding the new rod on. So I'm gonna take it back over to the car put it on there. One thing to note when you're doing this, that there is a little bit of adjustment in it. If you see the, the arm there is threaded because you can actually screw this in and screw it out to make your final adjustment. So right now that's all the way in and I'm gonna bring this in a little bit more. And I may have to wind up taking that arm back off and hopefully I can get this down far enough where it will work, but it seems like it's gonna be okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and slide this back into the door, get it through the latch, and I'll show you what I'm talking about as far as where it goes in. Come down here inside the door again, I'm gonna flip the camera so that you guys can see. So this little arm, goes through the bracket, which is down here. Right there's where that goes in. And then you wanna bring it up like that so that that arm sits pretty vertical. Now, there's not much adjustment after that other than getting that hole right here lined up in the bracket. So right now, it's off by about a quarter of an inch or so. It's really, really hard for me to get get it to, to focus in there. So it needs to come up quite a bit. I'll keep screwing this in. And 
and see how far I can take it before it bottoms out completely. Hopefully I can get it adjusted up high enough where I won't need to pull that arm out. So yeah, we got a little bit more to go. I'm gonna make the adjustments on this, get the rivet set in the hole, and then I'll come right back. So I've got the actuator kind of placed in the door there. I'm gonna take this rivet, which this is a quarter inch rivet. You can use a bolt and nut if you want to, but the rivet's what was in there originally. I think it's easier to put the rivet back in. Now this isn't the exact rivet that they used, but it's gonna be close enough to get this back in here. So you basically just put the rivet in the hole and you expand your handles out. You really need three hands to do this, but you start to crank this rivet in while you're holding the actuator on the inside of the door. And then you want to get the rivet flush to the door too. I think I've got it enough where it'll hold. And this will kind of draw itself up and get the slack out as you go. All right, so the actuator is mounted. We got a rivet in there. I will hook up the battery and see if it works. There might be some adjustments that need to be made, but this will at least. Cool. So that works. I'm going to go ahead and do the other side just to make sure it's done, because I'm gonna go ahead and do the power motor on the other side too. Before I button this door up and put this water shield back on, I'm gonna research my wires for the speakers. So I'd go ahead and put an aftermarket speaker back in this hole. Um, like I had said in one of the previous videos, I picked up this kit from Dual that was on clearance at O'Reilly's. So I've got my Bluetooth radio, I've got two speakers in here, uh, one of those speakers will go in this door, the other one's going to go over in the passenger side, and then I'll just run this Bluetooth radio in the dash. So I'm going to get my wiring schematic out, figure out which one of these two wires is the positive from the radio and which one is the common ground from the radio because you don't want to reverse these wires even though it's a speaker wire. Once I have that researched and figure out which color is which, then I'll get that speaker Mounted in the door, um, I'll tape up this water shield. I've got brand new clips for the door panel and I'll show you guys what those look like. And then we'll button this door up. On the back of the speaker, you can see there is a plus and a minus. So what I've learned through a little bit of research online, the orange wire with a blue stripe is the plus wire. And this blue wire with a white stripe it's gonna be the negative side. So I'll just plug those into that, put the speaker into the hole. I'm gonna run some self-tapping screws in here to mount the speaker in. Now, if this was a really quality <laughs> install, I would put like some rubber or some weather strip or something around this speaker to keep it from rattling. Um, you know, it, it's a Fox body, it's gonna rattle. And I know I just took all that stuff out of the door to keep it from rattling, but this will be mounted tight enough where it shouldn't rattle too much. I'm not going to be that worried about it. I just want to eliminate any kind of little stuff that's going to get on my nerves. So I'll get this mounted in there. Um, put the wires on first, of course, get this mounted in. So the wires will go in through here and then, of course, come out, hook to the back of the speaker, run those four screws in, and we're done. I've got everything back in the door, and the next step is to put the panel back on. For those that have never had one of these off before, they're held on with a bunch of plastic clips that look like little Christmas trees, like that. And most of the time they're kind of considered to be like a one-time use clip. They usually break. Um, sometimes this door panel will actually break and these clips will fall out. The door panel looks like it's in pretty good shape other than this bottom spot where the wood is 
starting to disintegrate. It looks like it probably got some water in here at some point. It's really just kind of like a thick cardboard is all it really is. But you'll see the little indentations for these clips. So I'm going to go through and replace all of those, uh, the black ones, with the white ones that um, I found an alternative source for. I'll grab that bag and bring it over here. These are the clips that I like to use, or whatever you want to call them, fasteners. Um, I had got from one of the big restoration companies, I got like a kit, and this was included in the kit. And I inserted that part number into Amazon, 1558PK, and then ran across a hundred of these things for like 25 or $30, something like that. So yeah, I've got a lot of them. <laughs> you really don't need um, very many to do this. Let's see, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. There's about 12 or 13 of these clips is all you need. So one bag will do both door panels and you'll have a couple of extras. So I'm gonna go through and uh, start popping these out of here. And you just move it over into the, the bigger hole. And then when you move it over, that clip will come right out of there most of the time. There we go. We'll get all these out. And then I'll open this bag up, put the new ones right here in their place. And then I'll come back once I got all my clips on. All right, this driver's door is back together. Lock works. Window works. I just gotta clean that tin off. So now I'm gonna move over to the passenger side knock it out and move on to the next little thing in this car which i think i'm going to put the radio in next i really want to get uh get that radio in there and get that going because that factory radio really sucks the the tape deck doesn't work on it i was hoping to keep it in there and just have a bluetooth module that would pop into the tape deck but i'm afraid it's not going to work right so i'll go ahead and pull that out Got my install kit ready to put the radio in, and I'll show you guys how to put a radio in a Fox body. Kind of the old school way that we used to do these back in the day. Uh, I know like 417 Fox, he's got a really nice kit that goes around this thing that'll hold like a doubled in, relocates the climate control down to the bottom, really makes it more modern in that center stack there. I'm not really going for that. I'm going for the uh, kind of the cheapest thing possible. So I'm going to put all this trim back together, get all this cleaned up, move over to the passenger side door panel and get it knocked out and then put the radio in. So now I'm working on removing the old window tent from the car and I've already soaked this down with cleaner. The key to removing old tent is to use a cleaner that has ammonia in it because the ammonia will attack the adhesive that is used to glue the tent to the glass. So I picked up this bottle from Dollar General, really cheap stuff, but hey, it's got ammonia in it. That's what I'm looking for. I don't really care if it streaks because I'm going to go back after I'm done. And what you're looking to do, you want to soak this as much as possible and keep it as wet as you can because obviously if it dries out, it's not going to do any good. The ammonia is going to lose its property of attacking the adhesive, but you can already see it's it's starting to come clean a little bit. Um, the, the part that I'm actually scratching on is the tent itself. I mean, if you come down here and catch an edge with your nail, sometimes you can peel the tent back. Bubbled tent is a lot easier to remove, like what was on the back windows. Um, right now I've got the back window almost completely done and it's soaked. I've got all the quarter windows done. This driver's window is really sticking on very good. And if you see the, the brown drips that we've got right here, well, I'm almost certain that's from uh, like cigarette smoke or something. So a little bit of nasty involved with this. Um, you know, it happens. This was a car from the 80s. People smoked back then. It is what it is. So I'm going to wipe that nasty stuff off. And then I'm just going to try to keep the top edge of that tent as wet as I possibly can because I want it to soak behind the film and start to break down that adhesive. And I'm just using a really old uh, razor blade scraper. And this razor is dull as could be. Now on the back window, if you're really careful, I think I described it in another video, you could soak that tent down with like a bag and you can uh, maintain the defroster grid. On this car, I found that the grid was already broken in a couple of spots. 
the attachment points for the wire to the grid were broken. So I just used the old razor to scrape it off. I mean, it's never going to work again. This isn't going to be daily driven. So unfortunately, if uh, somebody wants the window tent to, or if they want the window defroster to work again, they're going to have to go through and completely redo the grid of, of uh, tape or replace the glass. So for now, I'm going to let this soak and then I'll put my phone up on the tripod and um, show you guys how I'm going to attack this thing. So basically, just going to take that dull razor and try to start scraping from the top down. I'm just trying to catch an edge on this tent that'll allow me to get in there. You can see that's all adhesive coming off of there. And maybe a little bit of tar from smoke too. Man, this tent is really, really stuck. I'm almost wondering if this side of the car didn't get retinted at some point, or it's possible maybe this side was under a carport or something. The, the tent is definitely thicker and it's sticking really well compared to the rest of the car. I mean, that passenger side and the rear window, you could just walk up there and grab a hold of the film and pull it because the adhesive had given up. And the film of the tent was so degraded, it was basically just falling off. This stuff is sticking really, really good. I mean, I can only get maybe a quarter of an inch of a scrape and it's just not coming off. Yeah, that's just stuck. All right, I'm gonna try to let this soak a little longer. Hopefully I can keep it wet and get it to start lifting a little bit easier. I don't know. I might try to grab the heat gun and work the other side with the heat gun and maybe that'll help release it a little bit quicker. I think it's just not really gonna matter. This stuff is so old. It's just gonna keep coming off. And this guy must have really smoked in this car because uh, you, I don't know if you guys can tell, but all that's like brown from nicotine and smoke. So, Yeah, definitely going to have to wash the interior of this car when I'm done because it's just filthy. And after about a half an hour of scraping and scrubbing, and fighting, I finally got this window tent off. And this one was probably one of the hardest ones I've had to do. I mean, it, it really fought me. Uh, you can see all the tent on the floor and the Windex running out of the doors. So the next thing I'm gonna do is get this door panel all cleaned up because, well, all that nasty stuff that was on the window just rolled down onto the door. And, um, you know, you can see a little bit of dirt there, here and there on the doors. So I do have a little uh, extractor, and I might try to use that on these door panels just to clean them up, see if they come back at all. That pretty much covers all the window tin. I mean, I've got a few little places on the back window that I need to attack and uh, get that cleaned up and go inside and just give this thing a really, really good wipe down with some wipes and, and clean the interior of this thing really well. Uh, that that should not be brown up there. That should be like uh, blue. And I'm guessing that's probably from nicotine and stuff as well. And the window's a little, or the mirror up there, rear view mirror's a little dirty. I, I just really need to go through and wipe this interior down before I put any drive time on it because, I mean, there's some nasty stuff in here. And then give it a really good vacuum, put all the little trim pieces back together as far as I can take it, like those are the little pieces that go over the, the seats. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I've got, you can see the window back there. Still got a little bit left to do at the bottom and a little bit left to clean up on this quarter window. After a ton of scraping and cleaning, I finally got this back window almost 100% clean. I mean, down at the bottom is still kind of rough, 
without pulling the package tray out, I'm not going to be able to get it all. The package tray requires me to remove the back seat and loosen the plastics to get the package tray out. So I'm not going to worry about that right now. It's good enough to see out of. It's not as clean as it could be, but it is what it is. I did lose a majority of the grid for the rear defrost. It just happens. It was already coming apart in, in several spots, like I mentioned. So no big loss there. Just, you know, that won't work anymore, which on an 89, nobody's really going to use that anymore. I doubt anybody daily drives this car in the future. The next thing I'm going to move on to, because I've got all of my windows clean, I cleaned the windshield also. And sorry for my voice, I'm fighting a cold now. I'm going to install this dual um, radio, stereo, whatever you want to call it, up there in the dash. Now, with a Fox body, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Like I had mentioned, 417 Fox has a really nice installation kit. I'm not going to run that on this one. I've got an old school adapter that basically you pop out this radio and then the adapter goes in place and it kind of overlaps this area here. So if you ever see a Fox body, that has got a screw hole here and here in the corners is where somebody has put in an aftermarket radio using that kit because it is a little bit wider and it's got a pocket also. But um, in this case, I'm not really worried about this console. It's broken over here where I made the repair underneath this top plate. So it's not perfect. It's faded out. It's got a lot of scuffs and stuff. If you're using something that you wanted to be very, very nice and you didn't want those holes, the 417 Fox, as I had mentioned, you can find his channel here on YouTube. I believe he's got a setup that doesn't require you to like cut anything and there's no visible holes on the outside. I know he's got a, a new generation out for like dual den uh, radios that moves everything up. So I know you'll have to cut stuff for that because there is a support that goes right there. Again, this car is not perfect. I just want to put a radio in it so that I can pair my phone to it and, you know, listen to listen to the, something other than static and FM radio. If that tape deck was still working, again, I would get a Bluetooth adapter, slide it in there and roll with it. But the tape deck shot, so... All right, I'm going to grab my tools, show you guys how to do this. All right, we're starting off over on the workbench, and most radios come with this. This is like the cage. This is what actually adapts the radio to whatever um, mounting kit you're using. So um, basically, you just slide this into the hole, and you can see all these little tabs in here. You want to make this as secure in the hole as you possibly can because this is what's actually going to hold the radio to the adapter. So we've got that in there. And what I normally do, I'm going to switch hands. I'll go through and push these tabs down with like a 90 degree pick. So you want a, a good push like that. That This bottom lip is not very tall, so you're not really going to have a good secure bite on the bottom side. Now your sides here... You can see those two tabs there, they should bend inward quite a bit, like that. Let me get a better angle for you guys because I'm trying to do this with one hand. You really want to get a good bite with the tab to the plastic, like that. So that should be bent in there really good. We'll flip it over to the top side. Most of the top side ones should bend inward. You can see that lip is right there. So this one will bend in almost all the way. And the one down here at the end will bend in. There we go. All right. And then you can bend some of the other ones in if you want to, but they're pretty far back from the lip. So they're really not gonna secure it. We'll grab these two on the other side and then that'll be it to mount the cage to our adapter and then from there is the funnest part of all of this which is the wiring and for me i like to use one of the adapter harnesses you can get these at walmart autozone o'reilly's whatever you want i prefer to use the one that still uses the factory amp now not every fox body mustang came with the the factory premium sound amp this car has the amp, so I'm going to go ahead and wire it in to be used. Really, the only difference when you're wiring up the amplifier 
um, would be the use of this remote wire. Or sometimes they have it called uh, the power antenna or the remote wire. Either one of those two will uh, turn that amp on, and that's the important thing. I have found in the past when I've wired these up with an amp, if I didn't obviously hook up the remote wire, the amp wouldn't turn on. I got no sound out of it. So in this case, I'll be sure to wire that up. So this is the harness that comes with the radio, plugs into the back. We've got to wire this harness into our adapter harness. This will plug right into the car. We don't have to hack anything in the dash. To remove the radio from a Fox body, at least the stock radio, you're going to need these tools, which you can replicate this with like a piece of wire or coat hanger, whatever you want to do. These are my tools that I bought back in the early 2000s, late 90s, something like that. You just stick those into that loop and there's little teeth inside of there and you're just trying to get those teeth to disengage. Pull outward on the tool while you're pulling on the radio, radio pops right out. So now that I've got that out, you'll need to unhook the antenna and the two plugs that go to the back of the radio. And you'll see we've got a gray plug. This has all of our power and stuff in it. If I can get my hand to work here. There we go. That's the black plug. That's the speaker plug. This is the gray plug. This has your power connections in it. And then we've got the antenna wire right there. All right, all that's loose. I can move that out of the way. And the reason I did that is I want to plug in my gray connector for my aftermarket radio. And I want to verify that I've got 12 volts on one of those two blue wires. And I, some of these cars are a little different where not both of these will have power, only one of them. And before I get too far into the install, I want to make sure I've got the right one connected. So I've already got my test light hooked up to a ground. The test light's laying here next to me. I'll go ahead and turn this thing into accessory mode. All right. So now I would have power going to the radio or it would light up. And it's a good thing I tested this because I've got nothing on the blue wire with a white stripe. And I've got nothing on the blue wire solid. So I wonder, okay, I've got constant going to the radio. My switch 12 volt works. For some reason, I'm not getting any power on the blue wires for the amp, which is weird because I know the amp was working. So let me look into the fuses and see if maybe I got a bad fuse or something. So I looked at all the fuses, everything looks good. Now what I did notice is in this adapter harness, there's an empty plug right there next to the orange wire and the black wire. But on the factory harness, there's an orange wire with a black stripe that is also keyed with the ignition. So I'll put it back into accessory mode. It comes on and when I move it forward into run position, it's on. This wire that is the orange wire with a gray stripe in that position right there that lines up with the blue wire has no power going to it at all and then there's not even a wire in the position for the blue wire with a white stripe which is normally um, like your amp turn on wire so i think what i'm going to do since i know this one has uh, power to it is i'll take this connector and i'll move one of these blue wires over into that position and before I do that, I'm going to check. I've got another one of these adapter harnesses, and I want to see if it's the exact same way. So maybe something's a little different about this car versus one of the cars that I've had in the past. I have two more of these power connectors for the radio. They both have an empty spot right there next to that orange wire and the black wire. So there must just be something different about this 89 versus some of the other cars that I've worked on because... I know in the past that these have worked just fine. I'll go ahead and, get, and grab that other connector, and I'm going to move probably the blue wire with a white stripe over to that empty position. And um, or maybe I'll use blue. That way it matches this blue. Yeah, well, I'll move the blue one over and to that position there. And then from there, I'll be able to connect it all. So now that I have that wire jumped over in the connector, I can go ahead and start to wire everything up. Um, do not use 
wire nuts when you're doing this. I mean, they they work good for house wiring, but when you're working with electronics in a vehicle, it's just not good. Like the least case, worst scenario, like the worst thing you could ever use is wire nuts. <laughs> Just use these butt connectors. Um, you can buy a pack of these on Amazon for like 10 bucks to get a hundred of them. You can give them at any local parts store just like you can these wire harness. Just use these. Um, I installed car stereos at a large retail chain and we used to use little caps where we would twist, twist the wire together, put the cap over top of it and crimp it. This does the exact same thing. Um, another retail chain that used to put car stereos in that's no longer in business had all of their employees solder every one of these connections. That is the absolute best way to do it is to solder. This is the next best way to do it is to use these connectors. And then kind of my least favorite is the crimp caps because they would always come apart um, if you weren't really careful how you crimped it. As long as you double check when you crimp these, that they're good and tight and they're not going to pull out of the connector, then that's really all you need. So I'll go ahead and match up my wire colors and that's really all you have to do. So you've got like green to green, purple to purple, gray to gray, white to white, and then each one of them has a color with a white stripe on it, or I'm sorry, a black stripe matches up to those. These are your speaker connections. And then I've got my four wires that go to my power connection. I'm going to get all that wired up and then I'll come back when I'm done. So I've got all my wiring connections made. I'm going to go through and wrap this up with electrical tape just to protect it. It keeps the wires from getting tangled up. It used to be these radios were a lot larger and you didn't have as much room behind them in the dash for wiring. So you really had to make all this as compact, as small as possible. This thing is, uh, I mean, it's twice as thick as my cell phone, and that's it. So I really don't need to worry about it, but old har old habits are hard to break. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and get it ready to go in the car. And then I'll just pop this into here, which I can go ahead and do that. I'm going to take my keys out. So kind of the same thing as I use the other tools right there for. This also has little locking tabs that are on the side of the radio. They lock into those tabs on the inside of the cage. And we'll just go ahead and slide this in because it really won't matter at this point. And I'm gonna do this one handed and make it as awkward as possible. All right, so that's popped in there. That's what that's gonna look like. And then you can see the screw holes right there at each corner. That's where this is gonna mount to the console. This adapter kit did come with some, you know, some black um, screws to go in there. So I'll get the drill out, get that ready. And I'm going to wrap this up, go plug it into the car before I make my final connection of drilling that in, just to make sure everything works. So basically all you need to do, once you got your adapter harness done, is just plug into the factory connectors. Again, this is awkward to do with one hand, especially my left hand. Alright, that's plugged in. Spin the scray connector around and plug it in. I don't have the key on yet, so I won't know if this works just yet. All right, so that's plugged in. Now this is the side that goes to the radio. I said I don't want to mount my radio just yet, but I'm going to plug it in to the back. So that's plugged in. Let's turn the key on and see if we get our radio to work. All right. The concern now is I don't have any sound. Hmm. Okay. So I'm guessing that that wire did not turn the amp on. Hmm. That does not 
make my life easier. <laughs> All right, so I got to figure this out. All right, so I backtracked this, and I don't know why the amp is not playing any sound through it. Uh, I've got 12 volts coming out of my remote wire from the radio. Props to those that can figure out where I messed up and what might have caused this not to work, but I verified that that didn't do it. Instead of looking for 12 volts to come on with the ignition in that switch, 12 volts should come from the radio and then go to that last wire on that power plug, which is this orange with the gray stripe right here. That is what turns the amp on. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I can just jump that blue wire to that wire. But then I realized, well, I should be having 12 volts come from the radio to turn that on. So I verified that I was getting 12 volts on that wire from this wire from the radio. And uh, I was, and I still had no sound from the amp. So um, for whatever reason, this particular time, this won't work. Sometimes this will work where you can go through the, the factory amp. I've had it work in the past, but for whatever reason on this one, it doesn't. So I'll reach up under the dash there and grab the other two connectors that bypass the amp and then plug those into this. So the amp is now bypassed and I have sound, which is what I was looking for. So now I have the radio installed in the Fox body. I've got my power windows done and power lock actuators are done. We're about ready to go back on the road. Now that the radio is in, my power windows work, my windows are nice and clean. I should be able to drive this on the street with no issues as far as visibility or, uh, you know, getting fresh air into the car or anything like that. I, the last thing I really need to do in the interior is just give it a, a really good clean, uh, go through and vacuum one more time, do one more final wipe down. I have wiped down all the trim panels, the doors, the dash, uh, clean the inside of the windshield and the outside. I've got the windows down right now because I'm putting that radio in. It got a little warm in there. That'll be it for the interior after that final wipe down. As I mentioned, a few more little things to do to the outside of the car, and then I'll have it ready for the road. I'm going to take this piece of trim off, flatten it out, and then put it back on because it's warped, and you can see that massive rust hole behind it. I kind of want to make that a little bit more secure, or I might wind up just go ahead and taking it off. I do need to find another 5.0 emblem to go over on the driver's side because that one is missing. One of the cool things uh, about getting this back on the road is I can apply for an antique license plate. And in Kentucky with an antique plate, you are allowed to run whatever license plate you want on the outside of the car as long as you have that antique plate in the car with you. So for me, I found this on eBay and I'm a volunteer firefighter and this will allow me to um, kind of represent the history. I've been a volunteer for a long time now. And then it's from 1989 in Kentucky where I live. I can run this plate legally as long as I have that antique plate with me in the car, which I plan to. So this is a really cool find. I haven't seen these in a very long time. I really don't know when they stopped using this style tag. I know since my career started in 2001, I haven't seen anything like this. Um, we've since, uh, I think like 04, 05, they had a different design. And then now we have the newer design that you see on my Explorer. But this is a really cool find and uh, I'm glad that I've got it to go on the car. I don't think I'm gonna put any lights on this thing, but at least it uh, has the, the plate and stuff. So. so that'll be it for this episode of Gloved Up Garage. I really want to take a moment and thank everybody for the likes, the comments, the subscribes. That really means a lot to me. I'm almost at 700, and I'm really hoping to be at 1,000 by the end of the year. We're at the first week of June, and we're, we're nearly at that 700 mark. So share this with your friends. If you like what you see here, drop me a comment down below. Again, if you saw what I did wrong <laughs> when I was wiring that stereo up, be sure to let me know that, uh, yeah, I messed up. Good thing I didn't mess anything up permanently we didn't blow any fuses or anything but hey um that's what happens when you're out here working and you're not feeling your best little uh little mistakes like that can happen so thanks again for watching and remember to stay gloved up